college in 2017, which feels like a long time ago. Uh, while I was at Columbia, I actually co-founded the Columbia Bitcoin Club in 2013. So we met in a, in a dark room at the back of Learner, uh, and there were about five of us, I think, and we only met once. There wasn't a lot of interest. <laughs> uh, so we duly disbanded, and uh, it, it's, it's very, very encouraging to be here today, see cryptocurrencies discussed and debated in this formal academic environment. Uh, some, some more background, I guess. I co-founded, or I founded, a cryptocurrency-focused newsletter, CryptoChat. Also founded a blockchain-based platform for game theory experiments called Nashash. And in January of this year, I uh, started at the block. Uh, so I'm going to give you a bit of background on the block itself. Um, got to coordinate these two slides at the same time. So the block, what is the block? So the block was founded about a year ago. It's currently six research analysts and four journalists full time. We have three different products. So this first product here is kind of a free news feed where we cover announcements, breaking news. Uh, we also have a, a podcast series. This is the Block Daily. So you can think of this as the information for crypto. So this is where we publish exclusive news, investigative reporting, and some analysis. And then finally, we have the Block Genesis which is an institutional focused research product. Um, clients currently include companies like Visa, uh, the Justice Department, Andreessen Horowitz, Facebook, Deloitte, a lot of big names in there. And Genesis, which is really what I focus on, uh, covers both the intersection of traditional finance and cryptocurrencies, and then kind of pure cryptocurrency native research as well. This is gonna be the, the contents of this lecture that I'm gonna present. Uh, there's a lot of content to cover here. I'm gonna try and keep it fairly high level and not hugely technical. Um, the idea is that uh, today uh, there is this parallel um, functioning, sophisticated shadow financial system, um, which is kind of operating in the background. Not a huge, huge number of people know that it's actually happening and it exists. So the aim for this lecture here is to provide a bit of context, uh, what it is, how it's being constructed, why it's important, and also some of the outstanding uh, questions and challenges. Uh, so I might have to skip through some slides depending on how quickly uh, I go through this. I'm very happy to share the deck after the presentation, and I'm also gonna leave some time at the end for, for a Q&A. Okay, let's just jump right into this. Uh, Bitcoin is, is cool, uh, so, and it has some cool properties. So my understanding is that so far, this class is, has been introduced to Bitcoin, some of its underlying primitives, uh, things like public key cryptography, hashing, distributed systems, uh, its context within the larger kind of monetary landscape. So I'm gonna run through these slides fairly quickly. Bitcoin is cool. What are, what are some of these cool properties? Firstly, it was the, the first cryptocurrency. That's very important from a brand perspective uh, when you think about engendering this monetary premium. It has an anonymous founder, so a cool kind of founding story. It has a finite supply and deterministic <laughs> disinflationary issuance schedule. So there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin. And right now we know that 12.5 uh, Bitcoin will be issued every block in about a year's time. That will fall to 6.25 Bitcoin. It's reasonably decentralized and secure. So on the left here, we have a map of um, full node geographic distribution. Quite a lot's happening in the United States, some in Europe as well, Russia, a bit in Asia as well. So in order to actually shut this network down, you would need nation states to coordinate on, on policy, and historically that's been quite difficult to do. And then on the right here we have this chart showing minor revenue over time, which you can see is growing logarithmically. Uh, so currently miners are being paid about $17 million a day in order to attack the network to gain majority control under the assumption that 100% of miners today are honest 
you would need to spend somewhere on the order of $70 million. So it's quite expensive to attack. Here's a brief look at some, some Bitcoin market structure. So Bitcoin market structure is uh, increasingly showing signs of maturity. It does about $1.6 million worth of spot daily trading volume. That was in October. For some context, Apple stock does about $7 billion. So not bad for, for a currency that's only been around for... This is exchange volume or this is on chain volume? This is exchange volume. Uh, here we see futures, so uh, CME and CBOE um, released support for Bitcoin futures back in December 2017. Outstanding interest is growing quarter on quarter. Uh, so Bitcoin market structure is you know, maturing. Bitcoin does have limitations though. So namely, it is rather constrained uh, from a functionality perspective. So Bitcoin's native programming language, its, its script is not Turing complete, so we cannot deploy arbitrary applications on Bitcoin. And this is really born out of both the culture of conservatism um, and also just being slightly too early. You know, when Bitcoin was launched in 2008, it wasn't particularly apparent that these types of arbitrary applications were even necessary. We could do cool things with this underlying blockchain technology. So then we have Ethereum, uh, which some of you, hopefully all of you, will have heard of. And Ethereum is cooler, in, in my perspective, from my perspective. And uh, I focus a lot on the Ethereum ecosystem. So Ethereum is this generalized smart contract platform, has this Turing complete uh, virtual machine built in, which means that you can deploy certain programs, arbitrary programs, really, with certain guarantees. Uptime, access, censorship resistance, deterministic execution. So if we go back here, this is what Bitcoin scripting language looks like. It does have a language, it's just very difficult to use. And then we have Ethereum's native programming language, Solidity, which is based off of JavaScript and Python, so more accessible to your everyday developer, which is why we've seen more development activity on the Ethereum chain. If you don't mind, I'm just gonna uh, wait till the end to, to answer some questions. Um, but I, I, I will leave time. Okay, so we've, we've covered the basics. I'm not going to go too deep into Ethereum because I think you guys will cover that next lecture or later in, in, in this course. But just know that Ethereum, you can deploy these arbitrary applications. So, on to finance. Uh, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with Matt Levine. He's a columnist for Bloomberg, writes a fantastic column on money stuff. And Matt Levine often writes about cryptocurrencies. And the way he frames them is relearning the lessons that regular finance learned decades ago, um, but sped up. So it's this idea of rediscovering lessons, albeit at an accelerated pace. Is this true? Is this true? Uh, kind of. It's kind of true. Uh, so the rate of acceleration certainly rings true. Um, but some, including myself, would argue that open finance, so this new kind of paradigm has some properties that can't actually be replicated in traditional financial systems. And what are these properties? So here is the open finance value proposition. It doesn't seem very long, and I'm gonna unpack some of these properties in a second, but you can really boil open finance down to three properties, permissionless, transparent, and global programmatic liquidity. It's not very sexy, but uh, there we have it. So permissionless, what does permissionless mean? Well, anyone with an internet connection can, can actually use these applications. Uh, so there's no know your customer, no anti-money laundering processes that you have to go through. You don't have to submit your ID and be processed in order to access these financial products. And that's important because you have things like regular data leaks. So think about Equifax uh, leaking all these social security numbers, not very fun. Um, you can kind of think of access to financial services as a human right in this uh, day and age. And many people don't have um, state-issued IDs. So even in America, three million Americans don't have a state-issued ID. And that means they can't open bank accounts, can't access uh, kind of critical financial services. And then financial services also are often used as a political tool. So if we think about the US, what's the US's most powerful weapon? Really, it's their control over the financial system 
And that's why, you know, rather than going to war with a lot of countries these days, the US instead um, introduces sanctions, right? So sanctions punishes entire demographics, and it would be nice if we had systems that allows uh, some of these demographics, innocent people, to access financial services. And then uh, anyone can build and deploy these applications. So for developers, you can think of these applications as kind of open APIs. So these contracts, these applications can speak to each other. What this does is it facilitates integrations for, both, for things uh, like infrastructure and liquidity as well. And it really engenders this environment of um, seamless innovation. That's open source for you. So transparent, what does transparent mean? Well, uh, transparency, transparent infrastructure, transparent financial products allow you to avoid or temper things like global financial crises. So let's look back to 2007, 2008. Uh, part of the, 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 the reason behind the global financial crisis was both around opacity in assets that were packaged into these mortgage-backed securities, and then also opacity around the extent to which uh, banks were overly leveraged. So now we have transparent financial infrastructure, and I'm gonna show you some case studies later that they really illustrate that. And then real-time real economic data, uh, so that takes me to this quote from um, Professor Joseph Stiglitz, who also teaches at the business school. I think it takes me to, uh, there we go. Transparency, Joseph Stiglitz likes transparency. So here he's describing uh, this you know, theoretical electronic payment mechanism and he says, if we had all the data in real time, knowing what people are spending, uh, this would enable Federal Reserve to actually set interest rates in a much more efficient way, we would have better macroeconomic management. And that sounds really cool. So uh, Professor Stiglitz actually known for his distaste of cryptocurrencies, or well, he's known for other things as well, but in my industry at least. Uh, but here, what he's describing is, um, you know, ironically, uh, open finance today, as it exists today, and again, I'll have more on that soon, but, but just bear in mind this idea of data in real time and, and this data allowing uh, or permitting better decision making. And then finally, we have this idea of global programmatic liquidity. So what is the ultimate goal of finance? It's really to lower transaction costs and then lower transaction costs facilitate more economic activity, more economic activity and, and everybody has a higher standard of living. Uh, so the important factor here is, is liquidity. And if you can build these open markets, these open cross-border markets, and the idea is that you will facilitate the aggregation of liquidity. And this is already happening. So just to give you a quick example, there's this uh, blockchain-based prediction market called Warga. Some of you may have heard of it. And uh, for, the, for the Canadian election recently, it saw $200,000 worth of uh, bets taking place on its platform, which doesn't sound like a lot, but then contrast that with Betfair, which is really the global leading uh, betting platform, which saw just $20,000. So, you know, opening up these markets uh, globally does help attract liquidity. So this is what the open finance stack looked like in 2018. Purposely empty. This is what it looks like now in, in 2019. And uh, this is a fairly kind of unsophisticated, um, beautiful, but unsophisticated stack uh, that I put together fairly last minute, but it, it roughly illustrates you know, how we've gone from, from zero to, to one, at least. More than one, maybe 10. So now I'm gonna jump into some case studies and, and show you what kind of cool things can be built uh, using this infrastructure and uh, really try and convince you that these things are happening to, today and they're really powerful. So let's start with MakerDAO. I think that's kind of the, the foundation for open finance. It's launched in December 2017. You can kind of think of it as Ethereum's central bank, and it serves as both a credit facility and a synthetic asset issuance platform. So what is a synthetic asset, you might ask? Maybe you already know. Uh, synthetics are a type of derivative, so they allow you to emulate uh, exposure to an underlying asset without actually owning it. 
Uh, so if any of you come from the finance world, you can think of selling a put, buying a call uh, with the same expiry to emulate forward exposure. So how does MakerDAO actually work? Well, the, the core construct uh, to MakerDAO are these collateralized debt positions. And collateralized debt positions themselves are really just small contracts, so these programs that I described earlier, which are very easy to deploy. So what can you do with these collateralized debt positions? So I can deposit some Ether into a small contract, and Ether is really the native digital asset to the Ethereum blockchain, so uh, kind of analogous to, to Bitcoin. So, and it has some uh, dollar value. Right now it's trading around $200. So I can deposit some Ether into this contract, and the contract will tell me how much that Ether is worth. So let's imagine it was $150 worth of Ether. So this contract then allows me to generate tokens called DAI, but you can kind of forget that for now, but it allows me to generate tokens uh, against the value of Ether. And you have to maintain this 150% collateralization ratio, and <coughs> internally, the system pegs uh, each of these tokens that you're generating to one dollar. What that means is that if I have $150 worth of Ether, I can generate up to 100 of these tokens, which are called DAI. So I have, now I have $100 worth of DAI, or at least that's how it's being priced internally within the system. And again, if any of you are familiar with home equity lines of credit, this is kind of similar, right? You have some assets and you're borrowing against your assets. So what happens if the value of my Ether falls below $150? Well, someone can kind of step in and liquidate my collateral uh, and uh, cover <coughs> my debt. So they have some DAI, they burn their DAI, and in return, they get to take hold of some of my collateral. And this is, again, if anyone comes from finance or trading, this is just a margin liquidation. So this ensures that an outstanding DAI is always fully backed by the system. And this image on the right here shows how you actually generate DAI. So how much ether would you like to collateralize? Uh, 0.03, how much DAI would you like to generate? $2, you click that, game over. It's really, really simple stuff. But I'm gonna keep talking about it because there's some other cool stuff. So how stable has DAI been to date? Uh, how, well, not just that, how does DAI actually maintain its dollar pack? So as I said, the system prices DAI at $1 internally, but DAI itself trades on secondary markets, so it, it's kind of free-floating. Free so what the, what the system does, this make it out system, is it sets interest rates, uh, which you can think of as monetary policy, to incentivize borrowers to open or close their loans depending on DAI's relation to $1 at any given time. There's also some natural arbitrage as well. If you borrow DAI, uh, you owe the system DAI, and so you're incentivized to buy DAI whenever it's uh, below a dollar, right? And stability, uh, as you can see from this chart, has been fairly successful to date. So in 2019 itself, the average daily deviation of DAI uh, from $1 is about 1.238%, and that's uh, falling over time. This chart here shows you uh, volume weighted average price of DAI. You can see right now it's trading slightly over a dollar, about 1.0004. Uh, so this chart here shows the stability if you changes over time. It's this blue line here, and it moves in these jumps. Um, so uh, as the stability fee appreciates, DAI supply drops. That's kind of the relationship that we want, and that's the relationship that we've seen as well. So why is MakerDAO actually cool? I think there are uh, three uh, large reasons. So DAI, this synthetic dollar, really realizes Bitcoin's original vision. Uh, so it is permissionless, it is censorship resistant, and it is digital cash. So if you guys read the Bitcoin white paper, I'm sure you did, you'll see it, it was titled peer-to-peer -peer digital cash, something along those lines. DAI is really peer-to-peer -peer digital cash. Uh, the reserves are fully auditable. So what we have here is uh, the Ethereum block explorer similar to uh, blockchain.com that John showed you earlier. And here you can actually uh, search for the maker contracts. This 
this figure right here shows you how much ether is actually locked in these contracts. So it's somewhere on the order of 1.7 million. And then this contract here shows you how much outstanding DAI. Uh, yesterday was a very exciting day because DAI hit 100 million uh, DAI outstanding for the first time ever. So remember, this was launched in December of 2017, and now we have 100 million DAI, uh, 100 million dollars worth of DAI in circulation. So uh, remember, Ron Paul ordered the Fed. Well, now you can actually go and, and do that, right? So there's a story about how the Fed lost track of $9 trillion back in 2013. And now you can make sure that there's always enough ether backing outstanding DAI. That's really exciting stuff. And then DAI is also important because of um, the types of applications that it enables. So if you think about financial services, you need a non-volatile unit of account. Otherwise, you're exposing yourself to too much uh, currency risk. So I hope you guys will agree that DAI is, is really cool. Uh, who actually governs MakerDAO, the central bank? Well, in the US, what do we have? We have the Federal Reserve and the Federal Open Market Committee, uh, which sets the Fed funds rate, and they did that uh, maybe last week. So in, in Maker, we have MKR holders. So MKR is the second token uh, second of two tokens associated with this MakerDAO system. Unlike DAI, it's not pegged to anything. It's free floating, and it currently trades at uh, something like a $600 million market cap. So MKR, what does MKR do? MKR serves uh, as both a voting token and as a credit default swap type product. So you can think of MKR holders as providing insurance in the event that the system enters into a state of under collateralization. So if there's not enough ether to back outstanding DAI, then MKR holders suddenly step in. Uh, they are ostensibly incentive aligned in that they suffer consequences uh, in the event of risk mismanagement. So imagine if uh, in the event of a financial crisis, members of the Federal Reserve actually had to pay out of pocket to cover <laughs> losses. That's kind of how you can think about this make it out system. In return, they earn interest from borrowers. Here on the left, we have um, MKR earnings. Over time, you can see in Q3 2019, they made about $1.3 billion. As I said, MKR currently trades at a roughly $600 million market cap, and investors include Andreessen Horowitz and then other leading crypto asset investors, Polychain, Paradigm, etc. So the stability fee itself is voted uh, upon in, a, in this one token, one vote system. So fairly kind of plutocratic. And the image on the right shows some governance related stats. Uh, this is voter participation over time. It's still fairly low, but you can see it is growing. Here's some more stats. So um, 455 million, dollars worth of loan originations since December 2017. Uh, here we have um, CDP liquidations. So this is when the price of Ether falls below that 150% collateralization ratio. Someone steps in and liquidates it. Here we have the current system-wide collateralization ratio. So you can see that there's $3.5 worth of Ether backing every outstanding dime. So it's um, way over collateralized at this point. And then here you can see that around 1.7% of total ether supply is currently locked up in these contracts. So here is the data that Stiglitz wants, but can't actually have. Um, and as I said, $100 million done <coughs> yesterday. That's pretty cool. You can also obviously do more granular analysis around these figures. If I wanted, you know, uh, loan origination volume over the last 10 seconds, I could obviously get that as well. So more stats. So this is really a data scientist paradise, and if anyone here is interested in data, then please reach out to me because there's a lot of data here, a lot of data to be looked at. Oops, more stats. So this is the last maker slide, but just to give you some more context, um, what do we have here? On the left we have transaction count, so uh, there's roughly 5,000 or so um, die transactions per day, but uh, this is probably the more important figure, transaction volume. So the 30 day simple moving average. So there's roughly about $50 million worth of DAI that moves around every single day. And, and that's, you know, 
not an insignificant figure. That's a decent amount of economic activity. So here what we have, that was, that was Maker, remember the synthetic issuance platform, credit facility, central bank, very cool stuff. Here we have this, this other platform, UMA, uh, which you can kind of think of as an extension to this Maker system. So DAI is really just one form of synthetic asset, and really you can generate any kind of synthetic asset you want uh, through the same mechanisms, uh, assuming you have a reliable price feed. But that's slightly more nuanced. So, UMA, backed by Two Sigma Ventures, uh, among other leading funds. And they recently launched this thing called the Token Builder Facility. Uh, so what can you do with this facility? You can generate these same synthetics, but just a, a more of them, right? So here we have the S&P 500, we have Tesla stock, we have gold, we have crude oil. Anybody can suddenly issue these tokens and gain exposure uh, to these assets. And this perfectly illustrates kind of the seamless, uh, rapid financial innovation that we're seeing in this space. Uh, so from synthetic dollars to synthetic Tesla in a space of a couple months. And one kind of curious thing to note is that, and, and, and this comes out to kind of the interdependencies in this industry. So rather than using Ether as collateral, UMA actually uses DAI as collateral. So you post some DAI, some dollars, and then you get to generate these uh, synthetic assets. And what does UMA allow? Well, if you can suddenly uh, gain exposure to the S&P 500 or Tesla just with an internet connection, this suddenly opens up access to geographically constrained financial products. So now, if you're living in China, you can also have exposure to the S&P 500. That's, that's pretty cool stuff. And this just shows you how easy it is to actually issue these products. It's about three steps. And suddenly, uh, we have a petrol S&P 500 synthetic asset. That was pretty easy to do. And you guys can all do this yourselves. So let's move on slightly. Uh, we've touched on credit facilities and synthetic issuance. Now let's look at um, open finance exchange infrastructure. So here we have DYDX, which is a very popular margin trading and non-custodial exchange. They also support borrowing and lending on their platform. So what is margin trading? I can deposit some Ether and then go leverage long Ether by borrowing some dollars and using that to buy more Ether. I can also go short Ether by doing the opposite, depositing dollars, borrowing Ether, and then selling it. Why is non-custodial permissionless exchange important? Well, exchange hacks are really an inevitability. So there are two types of hacks you can think about. First one is funds being stolen. Uh, so this was Mt. Gox, I'm sure many of you have heard of it. As of July 2011, this was them advertising on the site. Over 80% of all Bitcoin uh, were traded on this platform. 2014, uh, they were hacked and uh, close to 800,000 Bitcoin worth roughly, oh, my math is really bad, but I think that's um, about $8 billion worth of Bitcoin today uh, was stolen from their platform. Uh, more recently, we have Binance at the bottom here. This was in May, so $40 million worth of Bitcoin stolen from Binance. And then this was just last Friday. So this is from BitMEX, which is uh, the most popular derivatives exchange, um, which somehow messed up and, and um, shared everybody's email addresses uh, with everyone else. So that's a different type of hack. That's a privacy data hack. Um, and that's not necessarily information that you want being shared with the rest of the world. Uh, <laughs> BitMEX is interesting because they support up to 100x leverage, so uh, you know, often attacks, attracts more of a degenerate demographic. Uh, so you know, if it's suddenly revealed that you're trading on BitMEX, then maybe your colleagues, your friends start looking at you slightly differently. I don't know, I'm not judging. But. Uh, so here we have DYDX. Uh, so non-custodial means they never take um, custody over your funds, and uh, obviously permissionless, so you don't have to provide, it, provide identification, all that stuff. Uh, so DYDX is just a couple of charts showing traction over time. You can see weekly volume uh, growing, it does about $8 million. Still fairly small market share, about 3%, uh, but certainly growing over time. DYDX actually offers the most liquid uh, ETH to die market 
and you can get about 0.3% slippage on a 25k market order, which is which is pretty decent. Uh, this is just showing kind of behind the scenes on a DYDX transaction, pretty cool stuff. Okay, so DYDX, also, also cool, right? If you're into trading, margin trading, then you might consider this as an option. So, but, you know, ignoring the non-custodial permissionless features, um, DYDX is, a, is actually a pretty vanilla continuous order book exchange, right? The kind of thing you would see on Coinbase, whatever. Uh, so, as I've been trying to uh, <laughs> convince you guys, the exciting thing about systems like Ethereum is that they serve as environments uh, for financial engineering experimentation. And Uniswap uh, really embodies this idea of experimentation. So it had its one year anniversary last week, and it was founded and developed by a single developer with three months worth of coding experience. So think about that. He had three months of coding experience, then he built this platform out. There's no real precedent for Uniswap in traditional finance. And uh, Uniswap is based on this constant product equation, x times y equals k. What does that actually mean? So you take two assets, okay, we have Ether and DAI, you deposit equal uh, values of these assets into a smart contract, these are just smart contracts again, and uh, once you've done that, the number uh, of, of the number of assets, so we have 1,000 Ether, 100,000 DAI, uh, this means that the number of Ether and DAI in this pool must always add up to this constant product, which is a really big number maybe 10 million. Someone who's better at maths can, can, can figure that out. Uh, so this smart contract enforces this logic that uh, the number of these two assets must always add up to this constant product. So what does this mean? This leads to this asymptotic price curve, whereby any marginal buy or sell will shift the price disproportionately. So, this is really incredible because what it does is it guarantees infinite liquidity. The last remaining asset in that pool will cost infinity dollars. Um, but what you also see is that price slippage increases super linearly uh, with order size. So again, let's look at this above table here. What we have is ETH and DAI. Uh, if I want to buy one ETH, uh, so, so ETH is trading at $100 at the start, zero ETH purchased. I want to buy one Ether, it's going to cost me uh, $100.10, so a bit of slippage there. If I want to buy 10 Ether, it's going to cost me 101.01, uh, so I'm paying a 1.01% uh, premium. And then suddenly if I want to make a larger order, somewhere on the order of uh, 500 Ether, I'm going to be paying 100% premium, right? So that's going to shift the price of Ether all the way up this curve. And if it isn't clear already, anybody can trade against this pool of liquidity. I think we have time for Q&A. Uh, how much time do I have left? Uh, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, ooh, okay. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna just run through this very, very, very quickly. Uh, Uniswap, oops, wrong presentation. Uh, this is what the interface looks like. It's a shame I, I don't have more time because one of the really cool things about Uniswap is that it opens up market-making strategies to uh, retail, so anybody can provide liquidity in these pools and essentially replicate market-making strategies. Uh, here we have returns for ETH to DAI market makers. Uh, over the past year, it's about 21%. Doesn't always work out well. Here we have uh, another market where market makers have lost about 13% since December. Okay, I'm gonna to have to skip through all this stuff really quickly. Uh, probably not cover it at all. Here's current users uh, from May of 2019. So each dot is one user. This is what it looks like in August of 2019. So this space is rapidly, rapidly growing. Target market stuff, probably don't have time to cover this. Next 12 months, neither. Um, let's just look at some challenges really quickly and then I'll open it up to questions. Sorry, I, I mistimed this. Uh, so what are some of the challenges here? Well, really it's the same kind of challenges that apply to all blockchain related stuff. User onboarding. Um, so how do you handle things like key management? 
Uh, what is crypto? Why does it have value? You know, answering those types of questions. There's no legal recourse as well, so that can be problematic. And you need to have more insurance products to, to kind of cover that. You need more tax clarity. And then we need market, mark, go-to-market strategies as well. Those, those are quite difficult. Technical risk, so this is things like smart contract risk. Things do go wrong when people are building these contracts. Um, and again, there's no recourse, so you need to make sure that you get them right, otherwise uh, funds can be lost. Um, regulatory risk, this is a really big one, right? Um, gonna certainly get questions from uh, FinCEN, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, regarding you know, facilitating this pseudonymous financial activity. And that's why we have things like the Patriot Act and the Banking Secrecy Act. Um, you know, those are kind of safeguards against money laundering and terrorist financing. Entre entrepreneurial risk, so I'm sure this thing that you guys are thinking about, how do you actually monetize uh, these products? How do you monetize open source software? And then you have certain protocol risks, economic risks again, maybe things that you will think about. How do you actually price risk in these systems? Uh, what, what kind of financial products are these? Uh, and then there's also kind of this risk, you know, if, if the margin to issuing these products is essentially zero, then we're gonna get some pretty shady products out there as well. Anyway, apologize for skipping over a lot of that. Again, I'll share the presentation and hopefully there'll be a bit more clarity there. Thank you. Thanks.